So welcome everyone to this uh, Dragon's Den session as part of the CBA conference. As you see, uh, we are doing some last minute interaction with our courageous pitchers because um, we had to do all of this virtually. And so in the last three days, we, we had to uh, discuss and communicate with participants to the CBA who till then had, per, had probably not thought of doing a five minute pitch about their innovative projects. Uh, and that's why it took us right till this morning to uh, finalize the pitches. Because as you know, if you pitch in front of an investor um, uh, panel, then um, you know, you, quite a bit of time goes into uh, developing your pitch. And as I say, we, uh, we had uh, little time to do that in three days. So welcome everyone to this uh, Dragon's Den. Next slide, please. Next slide. A Dragon's Den is not a Dragon's Den without dragons. Uh, you actually can see uh, our uh, investor dragons already in, in this group. They are here with us. So thank you very much, uh, Bijal Brambat, Edith Kish, David Sol, and Pam Tuan An. Uh, Bijal Brambat, Brambat is a director of the Mahila Housing Trust in India, which is an organization that helps women in India to have a safe and uh, sustainable housing. Edith Kish is director of development and portfolio management at Altelia Funds. David Sol has 20 years experience in uh, impact investment and asset management. And um, uh, Tuan An, last but not the least, uh, has the experience of doing a pitch in a Dragon's Den and winning that pitch. And after she won the pitch two years ago, her sustainable uh, forest restoration project really took a, took a flight. And so from the experience of being in the position of pitching her project, she's able to ask some critical questions along with the, of course, very important critical and constructive questions that our dragons will uh, pose to our uh, pitchers. Next slide, please. So we asked our, um, uh, our par participants to, to show their project and uh, we asked them to have five important components to show for uh, in this in this dragon's den. The first thing is that we were looking for innovative climate impact projects. So the climate adaptation or mitigation impact is a very important component. Next to that, of course, if you do a climate solution project, you don't want to have a negative impact on other sustainable development issues. So we've asked for projects that also, if possible, have a broader sustainable development outcome. The business case or the potential business case is important in this case because we are looking for projects that are scalable and that in the future, maybe at a longer time frame, but anyway, that at some point uh, have the capacity or the potential to, to attract private finance. That does mean that in the short term, it's completely uh, fine to have a project that is looking for grant funding or for philanthropic finance. Scalability of the project in the long run is crucial for this particular challenge. And when, when you work on a project, as we all know, your team is super important. So we also asked the pitchers today to give a little insight into the team that is behind the idea that they pitch. Next slide, please. So these are the five main criteria that the dragons will look at when they, uh, when they ask further questions and when they decide who's the, who's the winner. Um, the structure of this session is that um, after the introduction, uh, all pitchers hold their pitch for five minutes. Then one of the dragons will ask one question to the person that is doing the pitch after they have pitched. Uh, and when 
everyone has pitched their idea, then um, the dragons will go into a breakout room where they will decide amongst themselves who is the winner. In the meantime, the audience uh, gets a chance to ask some additional questions to the pitchers and uh, they will vote for their winner uh, as well. So at the end of the session, we will have an audience voted winner and we have a winner decided by the dragons. We are not going to announce the winner as yet. The winner will be announced tomorrow in the, uh, in the final closing session in the plenary space. So in the plenary uh, session tomorrow, the winner will be uh, announced. I will now give the floor to Fanny Verkuilen, my uh, colleague at ICN Netherlands Committee, and she will take you through the pitch session. Thank you, Jan Willem. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next slide, uh, which uh, presents an overview of almost all the pictures. So <laughs> I think Leticia is doing some last minute adjustments to this slide. So you might see, uh, see another name appearing on there as picture H, because we're going to have eight pictures today. Um, like Jan Willem already mentioned, you have five minutes for each, uh, each, each pitch. Um, I'm going to be introducing you, but apart from, from that, I'm also going to be timekeeper for the session. So um, what I'll do, I have a really nice and very loud butler bell. Um, you have five minutes for your pitch. After the first four minutes have passed, so when there's only one minute left, I will ring the bell like this. Which, uh, which is a clear sign that, uh, that there's only one minute left for you. Um, no need to, uh, to get nervous, but do keep in mind that when you have 20 seconds left, I will, I will be ringing the bell again. Um, and then we're really going to ask you to wrap up. And, uh, and for the wrap up, I have, uh, I have some backup support of Leticia. If we really need to move on to the question from the, from the dragons, then she might, uh, interpret with um, muting your microphone, um, but we'll just, we'll see how it goes. Um, then I think one more thing important to mention as well is that uh, Leticia is, um, she's, she's in control of the slide. So if you want to move towards the next slide, just kindly mention next slide, please. And then she will, uh, she will do that for you. Um, that's it. No much, not much more, much more to mention. Um, I think we can start with uh, with our first presenter, our first picture, and uh, I would like to uh, give the floor to Anita Grace. Yes, Anita. Oh, can yeah, can I can hear you. <laughs> Um, next slide, please. You, you can be a little louder or maybe keep your microphone a little closer to your mouth. Oh, uh, is it much better now? Perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, hello everyone. My name is Ineza Omoza Grace. Um, please call me Ineza. I am here to pitch the Youth Coalition. Uh, next slide, please. The world is behind in achieving the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. In short, we are far from behind in delivering our promises to the next generation, which is a sustainable environment. Currently, the youth participation in decision making is tokenistic, uh, good for the picture, and the youth face uh, challenges in highlighting their contribution in the achievement of the above decision. This leads to an increase of vulnerable community exposure along the globe, and there's no sustainable solution for our current climate issues. And most importantly, there's untapped youth opportunity resting on the national and international level. Although these challenges are all over the world, Global South youth are more exposed to this damage. Next, please.
our program aims to train the youth in project design and climate policy, fund youth participation in COP and in a consistent manner and open a window for youth lead projects. We will produce blogs, videos and storytelling but also promote the youth uh, contribution to go beyond advocacy, where we'll be able to implement, design a community-based adaptation project to address the loss and damage in the uh, in their own community uh, perspective. What we, uh, what we need right now for our eight month pilot is a grant of 100,000 US dollars, which will be used to train the youth uh, and also to find two youth uh, lead, pro lead projects and also to build a momentum of partnership. Our, system our sustainability stream lies in our ability to have partner partners such as uh, Global uh, Developers Foundation and National and also to sell our blogs on international level. Next. Please. Um, our team is currently made by 18 youth from four youth lead, uh, four youth lead organization from the Global South and the Global North, as you can see on the screen, we have the Green Fighter, the UK, the UK Youth Climate Coalition, the British Columbia Council for International Cooperation, International Justice Initiative, based in Australia. We have two coordinators, uh, Sedi De Coste and I, Inez Mozagres. We have a background in project development, critical thinking, leadership fundraising, and also youth mobilization. Thank you. Thank you, Initza. That's great. And well within time. Uh, it was uh, three minutes. <laughs> um, thank you so thank much you. and really nice to hear. Um, in the background, Leticia is going to be switched to another presentation, which has the slides of the last picture. So I would like to ask uh, one of the dragons if, uh, if there is a question for Initza. Hi Initza, fantastic opening as the first one to start with a pitch, uh, very brave of course. Uh, it looks like a very exciting idea that you're working on training. Could you give an example of what type of training, what do you hope to teach them? Can you give an example of some of the habits that perhaps young people are not doing today, but you hope to achieve through your training? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, we would train um, how, to, how to get the, the voice of the voices community on the table. Uh, so we, we address the local community youth to be able to write blogs and story and give them a mechanism to uh, to share their to share their their, their concern and uh, exposure of the vulnerable community. And on the other side, we train the youth to be able to go from an idealization into implementation of uh, of their of uh, the solution that they think their community needs in order to adapt for the climate change. And on our side, what we do, we give them uh, a platform for having advisors and uh, experienced people that will guide those youth. So basically what we want to do is like to, to train the youth to go from point zero to a certain point where they'll be able to implement with concrete results, something tangible for the, for the community, vulnerable community in a sense that we deliver indication on the national and international level and hence we can actively contribute to the achievement of uh, the sustainable development goals and uh, Paris Agreement. That's great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Anitza, and thank you, David. Um, it was indeed very, very good to, to start off with. Um, I think we're ready for, uh, for the next presenter and the next pitch. <laughs> and uh, we have Juliet Grace, who is coming up. Juliet, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, great. And I think Leticia is going to share your video with us. <laughs> so now still see Anita. A couple more seconds to get Juliet in screen, on screen.
Yes, there you are. Okay. Um, welcome, Juliet, and uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you could have the first slide, please. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you're watching from. Uh, so this is going to be something interactive. Uh, I want you to use your imagination. Imagine a moving bus with moderated conversations of young people, by young people, for the young people on climate action. Just imagine that, like let that sink in. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'm introducing to you this afternoon is the Climate Action Media Van. Uh, what the Climate Action Media Van is all about, it's about promoting climate action and awareness through experimental journalism, uh, conservation tourism, community service with support of technology in Uganda with environmentally conscious young people actively responsible for participating in climate action in their communities. Uh, next slide, please. So the project background and the idea behind the Climate Action Van is it's going to be a journalistic advocacy vehicle that will be used to create awareness about climate change and adaptation among youth in Uganda. The van will be an attractive enabler for community outreaches to engage young people in a fun and destructive way that fuses journalism, travel, community service, and climate action in one experience. The thing is, as young people, we struggle to comprehend the complex topics of climate change. And the result of this project is that we'll be able to understand what climate change is all about, how it affects our communities, and how we can be involved as change agents. Because the moment we associate with it, the whole van experience and the fun moment will enable us to take action. The other bit about this project is we are fusing journalistic storytelling, travel and life technology to enable the team of journalists to immerse themselves into the realities of climate change in the various communities and report from a contextual standpoint. Uh, next slide, please. So the challenge that we've discovered is uh, recent reports show that Uganda's greenhouse gas emissions per capita in the world are estimated at 1.39 tons carbon dioxide, which is far below the global average of 7.99 tons. What that means is we are not emitting as much, yet by the end of the day, we are going to be most affected by the impacts of climate change. Our public knowledge about the effects of climate change on a day-to-day -day in the lives of Ugandans is very limited. Also the existence of the innovations that communities can adapt hasn't really been highlighted a lot. Uh, the other challenge that we discovered is media coverage of environmental challenges such as climate change and disaster risk reduction is inadequate. Hence limited action is being taken by majority of Ugandans that are affected by these impacts. Without effective communication of information and knowledge about climate disasters, communities are left without the power to take action for sustainable living, hence the climate action ban. Uh, next slide, please. So the goal of the Climate Action Media Project is to build a resilient movement of young people empowered with knowledge and tools on climate change to increase local contextual knowledge, awareness, and a sense of individual responsibility about climate change issues among young people in Uganda, and also promote effective media reporting about climate change in order to increase informed, relatable, and compelling communication about climate change and disaster risk reduction in Uganda. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, yes. So how this works is we are going to have community engagement and we are looking at driving to 100, 100 communities targeting schools in and out of school youth. Youth will enter the bus and have conversations about climate change. The, these conversations will be recorded and shared on our media platforms. The experimental solutions in journalism with 
uh, partnerships with communities will en ensure that the young journalists are immersed within the community to experience firsthand the effects of climate change and then have youth-driven conversations on community service. Next slide, please. <laughs> Next slide, yes. So how we are going to- Go to your last remarks, Juliet. Thank you. Yeah, so this is how we are going to ensure sustainability. Uh, previous slide, please. Uh, advertising using the van, community trips, scholar sponsorships, marketing of conservation tourism trips, TV production, radio podcasts, social media, media training, research, and media product activation. We believe that this will enable us to sustainably uh, get the project moving. Next slide, please. Thank you, Leticia. I'm really sorry. We have to, uh, <laughs> um, I think we have to end it here um, because we've been, we've been over the, the five minutes. Okay. I guess this was going to be your last slide or not on the team. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, How do, uh, Juliet, how do you plan to involve <clears throat> more women and what local context you plan to talk about? Uh, so one of the local contexts that we intend to talk about is the issue of food security. Uh, here in Uganda, it's mostly the women that are involved within the food production and they're the ones that are actually being affected by climate change issues. So we intend to go out to them and tell their stories from their perspective as well as ensure that they learn from other communities on what they are doing when it comes to the same subject. So we'll ensure that we tell their stories, but as well as make sure that they learn from other communities what's being done. Thank you. Um, that was also the, uh, the dragon's question already. Um, thank you so much, Juliet, for your, uh, for your pitch. And then we're ready go to go to the next one. Um, just a, a small intermediate. Um, my apologies for, for turning off my microphone and ringing the bell at the same time. I understand that, uh, that you didn't get any uh, notes of that. Um, so I'll keep my, uh, my sound on for now. And um, then I think we're ready for Samuel. Just waiting for the video of Samuel to show so that we all see our next presenter. Yes, there you are. Okay, yeah. the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samuel Adurike. I'm pitching on behalf of Innovia, a project, AgroDrip. The AgroDrip project is a solar power irrigation system activating farm blocks and settlements for efficient, consistent year-round supply food chain and monitoring of agricultural produce. And our target customers are, are, are small older farmers. In, uh, we're looking also at investor agency as well as non-government organizations. This project is a pet project at Inovia and it uh, has a desired impact of well over uh, 23 million target farmers, small scale farmers. And then our problem, our problem is actually solving the uh, challenges associated with, zero, um, with hunger and we're reducing poverty to the minimal level through women empowerment, youth in green agriculture, as well as green uh, economic growth. And then as well, we are promoting climate action and gender equality, as well as economic equality. It's so doing, we are reducing uh, migration, climate migration that arise due to rural urban migration. And our target is that by 2020, we're projecting up to 25,000 geo cooperatives and 100,000 different farm clusters across Africa, owing to the large and huge economic and market uh, size. And our ideals as a, as a team, uh, we are a venture ready team, and we have resources and business models that are able to scale through our market discovery. And our, on, on, on scale, we have a micro, microgrid economic team, an agri and a station managers team, solution architects, control station officers, and platform managers. And on these, they are able to formalize a strong business model development. And then our, our, our target is actually human. So our, our, our project is human centric. And we are seeking venture development frameworks. In these, we are looking for other partnership for scale 
and which is essential to install other nodal plants across uh, the region. So this, uh, next slide please. Next slide, please. So imagine a situation whereby farmers can have an easy irrigation system without having to go to too much stress in irrigating their farm uh, produce. And then this, th these irrigation systems are smart enough to, to, to reproduce yields as well as uh, monitor water control for some of setting of their crops that uh, require as minimal water supply. So the energy sources are totally uh, renewable and then there's an energy drain where energy is conserved. And then the scalability of this- I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. Have Sorry, Samuel, to interrupt. We, you were breaking a little bit. Uh, if helps the okay. connections, switch off the video. Thanks. Sorry. All right. On the scalability, this uh, this uh, process can actually scale through farm segments and cluster farmings, and uh, this is achievable by building nodal plants, storage system, and water facilities across each node. Uh, our advantage is that we have a reliable and efficient drainage system as opposed to uh, the, uh, what has used to be the practice in manual irrigation system. We have season rank irrigation with guaranteed yield with a technology transfer base and the useful consumption and data to yield ratio is an innovation that comes from uh, smart agricultural practices. Then we have conserved energy and precision water supply. Our team is, is a formidable team of, uh, invest, of, of, of financial and economic uh, strength. And then we have also our Greek extension officers, uh, experts, as well as development consultants, which can actually help uh, and collaborate with other international agencies to work better on making this scalable across sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. It's also well within time. Um, maybe, I'm not sure, there was, was there a next slide with an overview of the, of the team or not? Oh, no, no, this is your last slide. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And I also think we have a, a dragon who'd like to ask you a question. Um, thanks, Samuel. All right. so this is and it has been a very interesting uh, project. I would be interested to hear a bit about the technology. Um, what's the track record of it? Is it already a proven technology? And is there already a pilot somewhere uh, in place? Thank you. Yeah, it's a pilot in place already, as uh, shown. And we uh, our partners in Bangladesh, we, we, we executed the first launch. And it works perfectly well. And we look to scale also in Africa and Nigeria as we have uh, farm settlements developing uh, such opportunities as well. Thank you. Good to hear. Thank you. Um, yes, we are ready for the next picture. Let me just uh, keep it going. Um, and the next one will be Pauline Natango. Um, I think we're just waiting for the video of Pauline so that we again have uh, our picture in front of us. Uh, of I hear the Pauline, video. but I see Tuan An. I've shared my video. Yeah, Leticia is uh, is managing the Zoom so she, uh, she can uh, so yeah, she can install it the right way. Paulina, I can, I can see you now. Okay. Yes, please mm -hmm. go ahead. Okay. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm presenting a pitch, which is in form of a, a fund, an investment uh, facility that will uh, support the acceleration of um, landscape uh, restoration activities done as a business. Um, is Leticia going to share my PowerPoint? Yeah, you can mention when she can move on towards the next slide. Okay. 
with uh, Leticia. This is a facility that is targeting to work with landowners that um, have innovative um, uh, land use activities that also uh, act as uh, businesses. And Leticia, next slide. Um, the way this is supposed to work, the way it's going to work, we work with the landowners. Uh, we support them to turn their land use activities into business ideas, apps, maintain connectivity um, in, 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 in the wildlife corridors, while at the same time building the resilience and adaptation of the communities themselves. Through this uh, fund, we would like to deliver um, some financing to the communities, some financing to the smallholders through structures that they own to optimize the opportunities that they have, the opportunities that are presented uh, by the landscape. Next slide. <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the opportunities are <coughs> in form of markets, we would like to identify uh, markets that, these, that we can link these initiatives to. The communities that we work with, they are in fruit production, uh, several non-timber uh, wood products. So we would like to support them to invest that they can sell, but at the same time, the way they structure that land use is such that it will, restore, it will promote the restoration of, 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 of the provision of environmental services in the land. They already have these initiatives, they already have the plans, but they don't have the financing uh, to, to scale it up to commercial, to commercial level. So we would like to come up with this fund that provides some seed financing. Next, next. Uh, next slide, that provides some seed financing uh, that can be given to these communities as um, in form of loans. So when once we work out the relationships with the, the value chain of takers, then we, we support these farmers to, to grow trees for the market or to invest in um, land use activities that revolve around tree growing, but with the market in mind. So we establish these um, connections with the market such that by the time they start producing whatever is coming out of this sustainable land use, there is already a market to offtake that. But what we need now is the market does not provide uh, upfront financing. So we would like to support to, to do those initial investments, but once they do, they do the investments, we also quantify the environmental services and the environmental services are commoditized, but instead of uh, those environmental services being paid directly to the farmer, they form the collateral that will link, that will, if in the event that they fail to pay back the loan, they use to pay, to pay the loan. So we, we want to have a, a, this kind of a cycle whereby upfront financing is given, generate environmental services. Those environmental services are, create, are used to access additional funding such that we provide multiple income opportunities for those holders such that it is that economic sense in, in managing land that way that sustains the, the landscape restoration initiatives. We have a we have a very diverse team that we work with of uh, community developers, business developers, uh, payment for environmental services experts, and biodiversity experts like myself, that we think that we have both the social infrastructure, the technical understanding and experience to make this facility work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pauline. Yes, <laughs> right on the break of five minutes. Um, was there, did you have another slide on the team or was this the last slide? Maybe this was the last slide, okay. No, that's the last slide, thank you. Okay, 
Um, then I think we have a question from one of the dragons. Yes. Hi, Pauline. It looks like uh, uh, this is this is something similar to microfinance. Is that correct? Is uh, what you're trying to achieve is, is kind of small loans will be paid back, and you want to set up some microfinance capability? Yes, it's some sort of microfinance uh, capability. But right now, these particular individuals we are targeting cannot access microfinancing because they don't have a credit history. So what we would like to do is to, to, first, to, to create a credit history using through this payment for environmental services approach finance by de-risking the microfinance by pegging it with the payment for environmental services from income from payment for environmental services. But yes, it's a form of microfinance that is reaching those that are currently not reached even by microfinance. Thank you. Thank you, that's, uh, that's clear. Um, this means that we're halfway from, we've seen the first four pitch pitches and we're on to the next four. And uh, Anita Grace, who we've seen uh, as first pitcher, she has yet another uh, business case to share with us. Um, as I understand from uh, from the teacher, from the controller, that Anissa, when you start speaking, your video will pop up. Oh, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so I already <laughs> hear you. Yes, there you are again. Okay, please go ahead. Please thank. Thank you again. Uh, my name is Neza Moza Grace. Please call me Ineza. I'm a Rwandan. I'm here again to pitch. Uh, for, to pitch a project for the rural community in their sustainable economic development. Next, next slide, please. The world is, uh, the world currently is investing in sustainable development, but the rate of achieving this is variable and rural, rural youth in the global south are far behind in achieving this. The agriculture sector being the major economic activity is threatened by the climate change, land degradation. This is also associated with other local challenges such as gender inequality and youth unemployment. This leads to the loss of biodiversity, the low rate for social economic development, and there's more pronounced gender inequality, especially in the rural area. Next, please. We have a pilot project located in Kibirizi sector, which is a 100% rural area in Rwanda. The project is aiming to conserve the natural forests of Kibirizi while empowering local youth to form a cooperative to sell natural honey on the local market. In addition to this, we will help initiate a community-based fund for women and girls to have access on finance for their economic development. Next, please. What we need for our 12 month fallout is a grant of 50,000 uh, UK pounds to train, into, to train the youth into conservation and have an advice in how to manage community-based fund. We will create a cooperative of 50 youth, 25 females, 25 males. We will install 300 beehives in the forest and we will use the software on, to, on how to manage the fund and the profitability of the selling that we've been making. Our potential income stream are to sell the honey, where one kilogram in Rwanda is selling on 26 pound, and each beehive can produce up to 10 kilogram. We, all, we also sell handcraft material and we invest in small sector business, such as agriculture, sewing, and other economic uh, business that can be that can be designed by women in the sector. Next, please. Our team is made by four youth from rural and urban background with an expertise in climate policy, business administration, business management, photography, and also team building and project implementation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> and again, within uh, three minutes, or almost for three minutes, um, very good. Um, I think we have a, have a question from one of the dragons for you. 
Thank you. Hi, um, and it's a very nice to see the project. I was wondering, um, what's the scale? So you mentioned with 50,000 grand, what, what, what would you achieve the size of the business? And if you could elaborate on the, if I heard correctly, the, the protection of the forest, how would that be achieved uh, in parallel with the activities like the honey protection? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So um, they, they, they naturally, uh, the forest currently is facing uh, uh, deforestation because the community use, uh, are, are getting used to cut trees for chocos and other activity. So we will initiate a conservation where the community will take part in conserving the, uh, the forest. But the, the youth in the, in the sector will be the one uh, to protect the forest because they will be having a linkage for the economic development. So we will and we work with the district to install 300 beehives as an initial pilot. So the youth will protect the forest because they know that they will get money. And from getting the money uh, when they're making profit, we will use that profit to, to initiate a community-based fund for, for women and girls to access money for, for, for their development. Because this is a, this is a high risk area because uh, it, they are, they are the community under the poverty line in Rwanda. So they, they, they don't have enough fund to, to access uh, development and they, cannot, they, can, they can't even access bank loans. So we will be giving them an ability to, uh, to have within themselves something that can make, uh, make them easier for them to uh, access funds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yes. Um, then we're ready for our next presenter, who is Janet Chapman. And that's going to be the sixth pitch we're going to see today. Yes, Janet, there you are. You're still on mute. Yep. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so my name's Janet Chapman, and I'm um, from Tanzania Development Trust, and I'm pitching on behalf of Mboni Avijana, or Eyes of the Youth, one of our partners. Uh, next slide, please. MVG was set up by Benedicta Hosea in 2013 in his small village of Zeze in western Tanzania, near to the Burundi border. Benedicto is the son of subsistence farmers, a path he always expected to follow, um, but he unexpectedly got the chance to go on to secondary school and then college, which opened his eyes to the causes of the increasing hunger and poverty in his village due to climate change. Unfortunately, his poor connectivity doesn't allow him to be here himself today, so I am pitching on his behalf. But I've been wor working with him for seven years and spent over eight weeks in Zeze over 10 visits. I'm in daily contact with him on WhatsApp, so I know it very well. After graduating, Benedicto returned to Zeze and started MVG to educate his community about climate change and how to raise his community out of extreme poverty. I'm presenting this as an example of a bottom-up integrated approach to climate change. Next slide, please. Next, okay, this is an overview of how the project works. Next slide. So there are many issues in um, Zeze. It's a typical um, Tanzanian village, but they have uh, succeeded in um, so solving many of them. So they've done um, conferences, youth camps, and many training sessions around climate change already over the last three years. Um, shifting farming is a huge issue. So they've set up beehives um, and villagers have a share in the income so that they protect the trees. Increasing population means increasing need for firewood, destroying trees. So they've so far planted over 11,000 trees involving many local groups and started a um, production of fuel efficient stoves. Next slide, please. And poor access to water is really critical, meaning that almost all of the villagers can't grow crops outside the rainy season. So far, they've um, drilled over 40 boreholes by hand, sometimes taking six days drilling through hard rock. Um, that's given access to over 24,000 people. They've also dug five ponds to irrigate 10 acres, meaning that 80 particularly needy families can double their crops. It was impossible for local people to get business for, to start small businesses. So they set up uh, a microfinance revolving fund initially with only 200 pounds um, and a 
business training scheme to go with it. So far, over a thousand local women have benefited from that and successfully set up small businesses, improving their income. Poor roads to the village led to major problems getting goods to market. So they're setting up a food processing plant so that maize and cassava can be processed locally, keeping more of the profit in the village. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, 98% of farmers don't have access to water year round. So what they really want to do is expand the irrigation system they already have to a further 80, um, further 50 acres in year one. Increasing horticulture, particularly tomatoes, means that they need cold storage locally to avoid crop loss. Currently up to 30% of, of tomatoes are lost during the rainy season in particular and 20% year round. Youth unemployment is particularly high, um, especially for people with disabilities. So they want to expand the fuel efficient stove production and recruit and train women and other youth with disabilities. And as I said, there is increasing need for firewood. So they want to expand the tree planting program and plant 20,000 trees in year one. Next slide. So expanded irrigation will mean 400 families, more families will be able to double their harvests. Cold storage will lead to a reduction in crop loss um, and the stove project will bring first time unemployment employment to 30 people with disabilities. Uh, the tree planting will bring employment to four women and two men and it will selling seedlings and firewood um, and timber from debranching will bring in 10% of the expenditure, the capital expenditure each year. Next slide. So this is what we're asking for. Um, all of the above will go into a revolving fund. The profits will be plowed back into the community. We have a good, very good track record. We've been doing this over the last five years. We're also looking for long-term um, partnerships, particularly with uh, business leaders and advice on how we can access climate funding. Next slide, please. Um, thank you very much. Those are our contact details. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. It's nice to hear. Um, I think we also have a question from one of the dragons. Ask the question. Yes, Tuanan? Yeah, I have a question for, uh, for, for Janet. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that your community faces a lot of difficulties and mm -hmm. oh, actually if it, I were you, I don't know where to start with. So can you give us some ideas about the current main source of income? Do they have uh, enough uh, productive land? Um, yes, well land is not a particular issue. I mean the issue is access to water um, and also access to capital. Those are the two limiting factors. So, um, yeah. Do they have competitive uh, products? Well, they grow, I mean, so the people there are subsistence farmers. They're generally grow, growing maize, beans, cassava for personal use, and they sell surplus. Um, there's a hu huge um, potential to expand into more, more cash crops, such as things like tomatoes and peppers and, and so on but that does um, need access to water and, and small capital investments initially for seeds and irrigation and so on. But it has huge potential. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. We can move on towards the next picture and that's Isel Lambatan, our second, second man in the group. Um, Isel, I think your video will pop up oh. once you start. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening from the Philippines and good morning from UK. Hi. Hey, welcome. Hello. Yes, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Azel Lambatan. Hi, I'm Azel R. Lambatan, the Communications Officer of the City Agriculture Office, again, the RO. So can we present to us our main slide, please? The first slide. So the, my, my presentation and my pitch is all about the river of gold, the river of gold in Cagayan, the city Philippines. For those of you asking, 
let me start by saying water is life, just like you watching uh, me right now from the Philippines. You are a person composed of water. Next slide, please. So just a background of Cagayan de Oro City. Cagayan de Oro City is the uh, city of golden friendship. And we have, um, uh, as you can see in the map, there's a map out there. Uh, that's the city of golden friendship. And we are um, a city surrounded by water. Uh, basically, our, our, um, our main ano, is a river. Our dividing point is a river, and um, as I've said, as I've said, my first part is that it uh, water is life. But the next part is also water is also um, a sign of death. In 2011, we suffered um, Typhoon Tendong, which killed um, 1,000, almost a thousand people, and um, I'm very, very sad about that catastrophe. That lives of my fellow citizens, and now. Our solution, as, a, as somebody who's working for the government, um, we, we propose that uh, we propose to have a de to develop spring development. One second um, uh, proposition is that we need to create more small reservoir, and the third one is to create solar powered pumps. As of the moment, uh, as working as somebody in the agriculture sector, water is of the essence in doing in especially now in the onset of the covid crisis and uh, in the onset of food insecurity we need to wrap up and to um, scale up our food production process and these tools the, the, the access to water is very very essential just a fun fact uh like again the Oro river is an untapped and undeveloped water resource why is this um why is this project innovative one it will benefit both integrative farming, fish, and vegetable nursery. Two, it will increase food production and address food insecurity. Third, and it will minimize water flooding in its areas. It will address most, um, uh, as for most of the SDGs. And the financial value is that uh, we don't have, uh, we, have, we have certain funds for each of the projects, but for the solar power plant, uh, solar power pumps, which is the most essential of it, was the most essential um, project. Uh, each uh, for two for two solar pump, it will cost two million pesos, and it will cover three hectares of vegetable land. So, if we can um, uh, have that resource, we could help. Um, it could really help our um, hinterland farmers. So, the financial value is that, uh, speaking in behalf of the fifteen thousand farmers and the one thousand registered fisher folk, I am. Um, speaking that water is of the essence in doing their business. And of course, um, I'll, allow me to share uh, the story of Mr. Tracy Palapar. Mr. Tracy Palapar is a farmer in Mambuaya, a hinterland barangay here in Cagayan Yara City. And he has a former resort and now he's engaged into business, which is he converted his, his, he, he converted his business it's a pool into a fish pond. And now uh, he is now engaged into uh, into fisher fish fund, which is very essential, which is contributing to um, production of fish in the hinterlands because the hinterlands they lack fish. And the people working in in the people in this community in these projects are of course the again the Oro River Basin Management Council, the Agricultural Productivity Office, and the city government in the Oro, together with DNR Department of Agriculture and the Philippine Coast Guard. And with that, having that said, I'd like to emphasize that water is of the essence to upscale the agricultural productivity in an urban setting, especially that we have experienced catastrophe and disasters. And with uh, to the dragon, I'd like to encourage everyone to help us um, create a safe living and productive water from the reach down to the reef. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you, Isel. Um, Leticia has just shown some of the slides, which have no, nice photographs the, of the area in the Philippines. Yeah. Um, is there a question from one of our dragons? Yeah, Isel, you seem to be a part of the government, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why should your government itself not invest into this project, and why are you seeking funds from outside? Uh, as somebody who is, who is um, I believe the, the resources of the government right now is really not really limited. 
but of course, yeah, we have already um, diverted funds. But uh, I think it's very important, it's very essential for the private and the public partnership, which is the government and the private sector. And the government, as you can see in the pictures, we have already been doing this. We've been doing the three projects, but up, uh, as of the moment, it's still, it's still not enough. And we are knocking on the public sector that if, if we could um, collaborate and add more value to the, uh, to the work that our farmers and fisher folks have been doing in the hinterlands, it would be really a great help in keeping, um, in, in, in sustaining our food security, especially in an urban and a metropolitan city like a Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, and thanks for the, for the presentation. Then we are, are already ready for our last presenter, uh, Timothy Awa Gaya. Uh, and I think when you start speaking, your video will, uh, will show as well. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Hello, yes. Uh, I'm we are ready for you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So there's a, a nine slides and I would request that we just go through the first seven. So yeah, I'm presenting on behalf of Plan Adapt and just to establish, uh, we are a network-based international organization. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, so social need that we have identified is um, adaptation decision making, which is informed both by science and local knowledge. So the, uh, there's an existence of a wealth of scientific knowledge, which is hard to interpret and apply by users, and is equally hard to communicate by the people who produce that knowledge. At the same time, there's local knowledge, local level observations that may lack a global lens. And it's also being experienced that there's into uh, there's a loss of indigenous knowledge. So our social need is actually addressing the problem from both the supply as well as the demand side. Next, please. Uh, what is our solution? We are proposing the creation of a cadre of climate scenario knowledge brokers. And what we are saying is that these people are who can understand and interpret climate models, but they can also at the same time integrate local and traditional knowledge, which will then help facilitating adaptation decision making and help design and implement solutions. At the same time, we are hoping that these people will have the capacity to continue to learn. Next slide, please. What are our climate and sustainability impacts? We are clearly in the space of better informed climate related decision making. So climate action is the first one. And then we believe in the way we work is networked with partnerships across the globe, but mostly in the, globe, the global south and global north. And we are also suggesting, um, so that uh, brings up the SDG 17. We are also talking about its applicability to both urban and rural contexts, which is why we have sustainable cities and communities there. We're talking about integrating knowledges and we are also talking about working with land. So that's why we have these SDGs listed here. Next slide, please. What is the innovative and new offer? The newest thing is the fact that these climate scenario portals are very recent and they have been evolving. But at the same time, if people have the time to access each of these links provided, they have become much more accessible now than ever. So for professionals that are in climate sensitive sectors like health, agriculture, infrastructure, what this can allow is for them, apologies, for them to be located in their local contexts and be able to work with internationally produced climate knowledge. It will help improving their positioning in the job and labor market, and at the same time, improve their access to further training opportunities. Next slide, please. The potential revenue streams, we have been speaking to a lot of different actors, who, some of whom have said that funds can come through training fees. 
But if one considers the people, the users of this knowledge, ideally what we are looking for are startup funds, especially for the design of the course. And then international funders who may be interested in sustainability capacity development in this field. Next, next slide, please. Our team is our coordination hub, which I'm also part of. It's our network of advisors, researchers, and experts. And then finally, the people that support and could be our potential collaborators. Next slide. This is some of the relevant literature we have referred to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sumiti. Well, it was a, a moving pre presentation, literally. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if we want to have a question from, from one of the dragons. I assume we do. But you, um, um, well, we, we added you later on to, uh, to our list of presenters. So, is there one of the dragons that would like to uh, to ask a question to Sumiti? The dragons must have questions. Mm, they're keeping quiet. <laughs> Maybe just sorry. Um, yeah, th thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I might have missed. So, is it applicable in one country or is it across countries that you you targeting? And I I also didn't catch what's the size of funding you you would would enable you to to reach this uh, this program. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for those questions. So, what we are what we've been working with initially right now, if we can show the second last slide, are partners mostly from Africa. So what we are hoping for is to scale it, starting with Africa, because we have partners here and there has been, uh, uh, please, please go up in our team. And yeah, so if you look at ACDI, CSAC, they're both at UCT and they have ha they've been delivering this program already. There's a lot of demand for it, but they're not able to meet the demand right now. So I think in terms of scaling, definitely, uh, working with northern institutions, probably from uh, Germany, where Plan Adapt is located, but also um, then as the experience grows, scaling it to other countries of the global south. I hope I've asked, answered both the questions. If there's more, um, please repeat. Yeah, just the size of funding you're looking for. Oh, yes, sorry, the size of funding. So I think we were a bit late in coming for the pitch. So that's one of the questions that I was not able to wet with the team. But um, if we are chosen or if we can take this idea forward, I think that would give us an opportunity to uh, get back or work with the potential funders for, uh, in, my, in my view, there would be an initial um, pilot fund and then based, so the initial funding would be to um, create the program itself. And my apologies for the noise. It's a public holiday in South Africa right now. So everybody's home. No, no worries. Thank you. <laughs> no worries about that. Um, thank you indeed for your, uh, for, for your presentation and your pitch. Um, and with, uh, with that last presentation, we've seen all of our eight pictures for, uh, for today's Dragon Den session. What I think uh, we're going to do now is that all the dragons, they will get together in a separate breakout room away from us for a moment and they will um well they'll put their uh, their findings and their results next to each other so leticia she will put uh, put the dragons in the breakout room and um <clears throat> the dragons will come back after um, 10 to 15 minutes so in the meantime we have some um, some time for uh, for questions and a, and a mentimeter poll I see some dragons who are leaving us. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now that the dragons are gone, we can speak freely again. Um, once again, thank you everyone for, for your presentations. If we were in, uh, in the actual conference, I think the room would have given you all a big applause. And um, uh, 
one of the dragons already said it, but I'm uh, I'm very proud of uh, of everyone who uh, who was uh, so brave to get in front of the microphone and get in front of the camera and share their their ideas with us. Um, there was only time for for one question uh, for each presentation during the session or do, during the, the pitches. But now we have some time for additional questions uh, or maybe suggestions or sharing of ideas. Um, so what I actually want to do is just open up the floor and see if, if anyone from the audience might have a question or a suggestion for, uh, for any of the presenters. And I do realize that it's very, very I, exciting. Yes, Leticia. I have a question. Um just before we go to the Mentimeter. Um, I'm very curious to hear what's the experience of the pitcher, like how he is putting together a pitch and what they learn from their experience. Thank you. Is there one of the, um, one of the presenters who would like to, uh, to share some of their, uh, something with us? Inita, yes. I'm happy to talk as well if Anise is not ready. Um, I found it a really um, interesting experience. I wish I'd planned to do this a lot, lot earlier. Um, so it was very, for us, it was very, very last minute and trying to get hold of all of the relevant um, financials um, at the last minute is very challenging, but I think it's extremely useful um, experience to go through. Thanks. That's nice to hear. Anita? Okay. Um, also, for me, I would like to I would like to share the fact that it's a it's a kind of a challenging three days that you have to go through, and for people like uh, us in the in the public sector where we tend to picture everything into impact, so it's good to learn how you can you can translate your your impact into a business case and you can attract uh, investors so that you what you are doing will last if, even after the initial grant so it's really amazing and actually something i can recommend for everyone and it's not a scary thing you can go with an idea then you have a, a support team to help you uh, translate your idea into concrete step that you need to take in order to implement it thank you thank you yeah um I see there's a question from Caroline, but I think I also saw a raised hand from, from Samuel. Did you want to share your experience? Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you organizers uh, uh, for the community-based adaptation conference 20, uh, the 14th edition. It's really good opportunity to share ideas and then rub minds and meet with people of like mind uh, developing this and uh, pushing forward uh, solutions and ideas, uh, we found out that it was uh, quite challenging. And uh, another opportunity we had was uh, the, the opportunity to have a training on pitching, which uh, is really, really impactful. Uh, of course, I learned new things and so to develop a skill for every existing uh, business or an idea or a model or an action that is really uh, solving uh, climate action through adaptation. Uh, we are part of the uh, African Adaptation Youth Network and then Africa Circular Economy and it's good to be here and I look forward to future partnership and engagements in community-based adaptation. Thank you very much. That's nice to hear. Everyone is uh, it's rather positive and, and sharing with us just Go for it if you feel that you have an idea. Um, Caroline, you raised your hand earlier, but I also saw a remark from you in the chat. Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, share? Hi, um, thanks so much. It's Caroline from the British Red Cross. Um, I really liked all of the presentations. Um, I, I did have a question. Um, for the projects from like Rwanda and Tanzania, um, it sounded like there was quite a lot of similarity um, between you. So I thought maybe it would be great uh, 
for you to kind of form like a support network in the future um, to exchange, like exchange ideas on what worked and what didn't work um, from like the kind of ground up community led um, adaptation activities. Um, and yeah, just to say that like um, we've recently been trying to kind of document all of these local actions that do work um so we'd be happy to like hear more and see if we can document some of these um more with others as well thank you thank you can i respond to that um i'd be delighted to work um, in, with anasa and and also with, with you caroline so yeah that's fantastic thanks yay that's great that's great news <laughs> This is really nice to see that the networking part, even though we're not meeting each other physically, that the network working part can still continue. And um, well, what I've learned from, from being involved with previous pitchy events, uh, you're just expanding your network is, is also just already one of the rewards to participate or to, uh, well, to, to be an audience, but definitely when participating that will always do your network some uh, some good. Um, I don't see any uh, any other hands raised from the audience. So yes, indeed, the teacher has also already shown the slide. Um, we can I, continue to the. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, it's Juliet. Um, Juliet. I was just having connection issues. So I had to switch to my phone. Uh, I think for me overall. Uh, it's my first time pitching, and I think ah. I'm lucky because Jasper and Amias and Jan were really helpful through these last couple of days, uh, guiding us through what needs to be done, looking at our pitch decks, and also it's really very helpful. And also the fact that during this process, I've been able to highlight so many similarities with other projects. And there is so much room for collaborations with other guys from different countries. Thank you, Juliet. That's good to hear too. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, then I think we can continue to the to the Mentimeter. And um, I'm not sure if everyone is um, is ex has some experience with a uh, Mentimeter. But as you see in the slide, uh, if you go towards your browser and go to menti.com, then uh, in the first window, they'll ask you to, uh, to put in, to provide a code, which is shown in the slide here. Um, and then the Mentimeter poll has a couple of questions. Amias, would you like to add something to that? I... Yeah, I will place the uh, the link in the chat box as well for everyone to. Uh, oh well, I see our Zoom support has done that too. And seeing uh, as the dragons are deciding on their winner, we felt the the audience should also be able to decide on their winner. Um, we have a few questions uh, for them. In this case, we'd like to start with. I see that things are working out on themselves. Uh, the, there's a link directly as well for anyone who doesn't want to use a code. So the first question we were, in, we're interested in is, uh, do the pitchers generally meet the Dragon's criteria? Uh, over the last few days, we got to hear what one needs to make a good a business case, a good project. And well, <laughs> it seems that everyone all the pitchers generally do. All right. Now, obviously, the part where we're all excited for is which pitcher should win, according to you. We had seven pitchers in this case. Eight, my bad. Eight pitchers. Um, no, no, it's seven pitchers. Eight, yeah, seven, seven pitchers, eight, eight pitches. pitches. Yeah, exactly. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And 
before we get to this part. We also thought it'd be really interesting to see what convinced you to select the winning pitcher. I think in the prep for those that attended yesterday's session on what makes a good pitch, uh, Jesper also mentioned passion as a very important thing. How, how involved are you with, because that helps selling your project and, and, and that it's, uh, you mentioned how a pitch, I actually wrote it down, um, is like the start of a relationship that you have to follow it through. Now, all these results uh, will be shared eventually, and you can, I think, put in your email as well. Well, let's see. There was passion. How do we, uh, there we go, pause. So Amiyas, are you going to uh, show some of the results of the maybe the first question or not? So in this case, it's the idea was that everyone can. Um, this was a general criteria. Did they meet? Did they generally meet the criteria? And in this case, it seems that the audience agrees that mm -hmm. <laughs> most of the criteria, um, which were determined and shared before in the presentation that are necessary for a good pitch, uh, we're all met in this case. Mm -hmm. um, it also shows to me that too bad you can't select per pitch, but I don't think we have, we have, we have time for that. Um, and there isn't really a discrepancy, seeing as they all received really high scores. Uh, I think the business case part might be the, the lowest one, seeing as this, this is obviously also the financial bit. Mm -hmm. um, which is something that needs to be worked out depending on how far pitchers are or how far bid pro projects are. So mm -hmm. that, I think, uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh -oh. I don't know how much time we have left. There's a couple of minutes left and uh, Leticia is, uh, is about to bring the dragons back from their, uh, their private session. Um, so then we have, uh, have Jan Willem who will wrap up this session. Okay. Is that the, can you see if everyone filled out the Mentimeter? I see that okay. 16 people have uh, okay. filled okay. out the so, Mentimeter. Um, just an open question. Can the presenters themselves also fill out the Mentimeter? As long as you don't choose yourself, I think that'd be fair, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be fair play indeed. Because yeah. I see we have 24 people in our uh, Zoom room. If, if 16 of them filled out the Mentimeter, so we have seven presenters and yourself, that would make for the 16 remaining audience participants to have filled out the Mentimeter. I, I realize oh, I don't. Nice. I realize that the the results were not being shared. <laughs> <laughs> so I was talking this about. Nice. So this was a, this was this is what uh, so far we uh, we have all decided on. At least sixteen people have, and like I mentioned, the lowest score right now is for the business case, um, which involved the uh, the financial aspect, which not everyone, uh, depending on their on the stage, as mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, of the project could actually comment on. Uh, and all the other criteria have uh, generally been met, meaning we all agree that these were really good pitches. Uh, I think that is a very interesting question from Anastasia on the chat box. Absolutely. Uh, she says, asking, can you present an overview of all the pitches and their theme? We'd have to go through the, the presentation then quickly. Is that is that the way you'd like to do it, Leticia? 
Uh, maybe we can ask the pitchers to describe their pitch in uh, one mm -hmm. short <laughs> sentence and uh, describe their team as a suggestion. That works. Yeah. Um, you would like to give the floor to every uh, presenter again, right? Yeah, I think uh, they might be able to give like a very short, with one sentence, uh, what their pitch was about, just to have a, to summarize. <laughs> just to summarize, okay. Um, Anita, could you summarize in two words again, or three words? <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Um, my first pitch was uh, is the one for the youth uh, loss and damage youth coalition, and I'm doing it with a uh, group of youth from uh, the global south and the global north, uh, with an experience in uh, climate policy, environmental policy, and uh, youth mobilization and leadership. Uh, so my and then the, my second pitch is the one for the uh, community how to conserve a forest, but by creating. Um, an economic value for the youth in this sector where they're much vulnerable in terms of uh, economic ability. So this I'm doing it with a team called the Green Fighters. So we are, we are a team of four youth with an expertise in business administration, environmental policy, leadership, and photography. I think I kept the two minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Juliet. Uh, so the Climate Action Media Van basically is an advocacy tool. So what we are saying is how do you bring young people together to actually communicate and also contribute to the to climate action. Uh, the team I'm working with, uh, personally as Juliet, I've been in the environment space for quite a long time. I am currently the interim facilitator for UNCCD which is taking action on desertification and land issues. My colleague, Anika, is a journalist and also the founder of InfoNile. Her role is basically to communicate and also tell stories on water, but basically around the River Nile, Benson, and countries that are covered with River Nile. And then the other person on the team is Abbasin Pindi, who works with the National Task Force uh, on the fourth industrial revolution here in Uganda. So what brings us all together is the fact that we are passionate about communication and also taking action on climate change. Thank you so much. Um, Samuel, would you give a very short sum up? Yeah, thank you. The agro, agro group is a little scale project. Uh, as an individual and uh, in organization capacity, uh, we're part of the Africa Circular Economy, and uh, also we are working with the uh, Ministry of Environment and then and Climate Change Departments on the, um, reviewing the national indices, and of course the uh, on the Yongo Working Group or UN Food System, we are also partaking and working closely. With, in developing the NDC review as well. Also, we are engaged also as part of uh, the Youth Adaptation Network. So the agro drip basically is just a way of helping farmers to assess uh, funding irrigation system that are smart enough to help their youth uh, cutting across uh, the value chain for particularly in production sustainable production pattern, um, marketing of their products, conservation is necessary, and then preservation of their produce as well as storage, as well as uh, the final chain, which is uh, the sale and the marketing to make the market accessible and affordable for them in a way, uh, also through uh, a blockchain technology, which we might be incorporating later, but we're working on it at the moment. Uh, finally, uh, we are promoting uh, responsible consumption patterns and this project specifically uh, empowers women, youth in rural areas, uh, mitigates climate in many ways, as well as uh, provides uh, inclusion, 
economic inclusion for a vast population of local uh, local communities and uh, population. So in a way, we are um, reducing migration, climate migration uh, challenges as well. So I that's just a brief of, about. Thank you, Samuel. Um, I just I got to notice that we're running over time a little bit. And I just want to check with, uh, with Jan Willem. We were doing a small sum up from every participant and we have four more to go. Shall we do them very quickly? Or um, what, what uh, do you think? Is if, if everyone in the room uh, has more time, then uh, by all means. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that there's also still the audience to do the, the audience vote. If, yeah, uh, we did the audience vote. Oh, you did the audience vote. Okay. Okay, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, if, if everyone, hello everyone, great uh, that you're here still. So uh, yeah, if you have time, then uh, let's, uh, let's uh, continue that. Great. Yeah. We, we just continue. Then we have uh, Pauline, can you give us a very short sum up? Uh, thank you very much. Our pitch is uh, intended to establish a facility that will promote uh, landscape restoration as a business. We would like to get some funding that will de-risk smallholder-led investments such that they, they, they manage their land sustainably because it makes business sense to them. We would like to deliver this funding in a manner that uh, removes risks, but also enables them to access additional income opportunities as an incentive to manage land uh, sustainably. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Janet. Hi, um, I'm Janet from Tanzania Development Trust, which is a volunteer-run charity that's been supporting grassroots projects in rural Tanzania for 45 years. Um, I talked about one of our partner projects um, in Zeze Village about the um, issues that they have and how they've overcome them so far and how with additional support they could do so much more. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Diesel. Hello, so my our project is about so our project is about constructing efficient water systems no, to, mit, to mitigate uh, to increase agricultural productivity and also to mitigate disaster risk because here in Kagayan the Oro we have a, a river and we I we consider it as a as a gold mine and if we this is an untapped and undeveloped resource. And in order for us to cope with food security and uh, also with disaster risk, we need uh, more support from the private sector to create more spring development, um, small farm reservoir water catchment, and also to buy so more solar powered water pumps. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. And then we have Samiti. Hi, thank you. Um, I basically, we have uh, proposed a training program that can be taken to scale. And we propose that this training be provided to people who can be knowledge brokers between science and traditional knowledge. And our passion and our experience as part of the ASAR program, where myself, Jesse, Martin, and a few more in PlanAdapt were part of a project where we worked with both climate scientists and people on the ground in Africa and Asia. So our solution is um, dependent upon the funding we get. We will, scale, we will initially work on a pilot to develop this training and um, then take it to scale, hopefully, dep depending on the successes and the lessons learned. So uh, we rely upon a lot of knowledge that already exists and we are seeking to train people who are um, not exactly youth, but professionals wanting to um, engage with climate knowledge more deeply, both men and women and other genders. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone, all the pictures for all your presentations. We are uh, going to wrap up the session, but before we do that, I think uh, just another virtual big applause for, uh, for all of you. And then over to Jan Willem. Thanks. 
This was really a wonderful session. It was very inspiring to see all the ideas, uh, great projects on all fronts, but also very good presentations. And um, I cannot repeat enough that uh, you often had 24 hours or less to decide to, to come and join and pitch and, and actually make the pitch. So that's really impressive. Um, I also got uh, a similar feedback from the Dragons. They were very impressed, very enthusiastic about all the ideas, very difficult to choose which idea is better or more important. They're all very important and it's exciting to see how much energy there is, uh, there is around. I did have some slides um, because we have some announcements. So, uh, as you know, the Dragons have uh, made a decision. The Mentimeter voting system has captured your decisions and uh, combined that into an outcome. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to share you with you the outcome here and now because we thought it would be much better to give extra exposure to the two uh, top uh, score holders. So two uh, persons will be um, announced tomorrow in the plenary uh, session that is the, the closure of, of the CBA 14. So that means that we would like to ask all of you to make sure that you join the, the closing session tomorrow, which I believe is uh, starting at 12 p.m. noon UK time. Be prepared, because if you are one of the two winners, then you will be asked to say something about your project and then bring it down to one minute. No slides, just you in person, uh, giving a summary of the, the core essential of your project. And then of course you can choose uh, on what five criteria to focus or to try to bring it all down into one minute. So come to the uh, closing session tomorrow and uh, then wait for the announcement. And if your, um, if your name is mentioned, then uh, come forward and you'll be asked uh, to pitch in one minute. Of course, everyone is a winner in this uh, exercise. So uh, we want to emphasize that this is about uh, enlarging, enlarge, enlarging and broadening your, your network, uh, reach out to each other because uh, first and foremost, you can, you can learn from each other. But of, of course, also we as organizers, we will make sure that uh, we look for organizations and individuals that we think might be able to, to help you a little bit further, either through training or through access to investors. So we'll make uh, sure that we do that uh, as much as possible. Um, next slide, I guess. Oh, I thought it was a long slide, but that's okay. I want to use this opportunity to thank uh, very much um, uh, the four dragons, uh, Bijal Brambat, David Sol, Edith Kish, and Tuan An. Uh, thank you very much for your time, for your insights, and for uh, the, the very good questions that, uh, that you have uh, posed in this session. Thank you very much for, uh, for joining as a dragon. Um, then, of course, uh, first and foremost, everyone that has pitched today uh, and your colleagues who uh, probably have uh, have supported you in uh, perfecting the, the presentation of the pitch thank you very much for uh, sharing this for stepping out in the open and uh, having the courage to to pitch your idea we all know that that's not uh, easy and um, especially also in this new format relatively new format of doing all of this without interpersonal contact it's it's even more difficult to uh, to do that in a zoom meeting so thank you very much for uh, 
uh, your the inspiration and the examples that you gave us. Um, then I would like to ask uh, the various, uh, the group of volunteers that have made this possible, uh, Amjas, Debbie, Letizia, Becky, and also Jesper, who supported us in um, the pitch training yesterday, uh, Maxime, that supported us in the business canvas meeting, and last but not least, Fanny Verkuilen, my colleague, who uh, was uh, hosting and facilitating this session today. So thank you very much, everyone. Do reach out to us with more questions, suggestions, feedback, if you want more information, if you feel that you, you need support in, in one of the areas that you work in, don't hesitate to, uh, to, um, to link to us and write to us. Find us on LinkedIn, because as we have uh, heard a lot this week, this CBA 14 community-based adaptation meeting is about uh, linking to other practitioners and specialists in the fields and broadening our networks. So, um, so see you all tomorrow in the plenary and um, let's see who the winners are going to be. Uh, but as we said before, everyone is a winner in uh, this kind of an exercise. Um, is there anything else that we had to announce? I'm looking at my colleagues, Letizia. No. Any last no. comments? Uh, not at all. Uh, I, I just want to thank everyone because I, I believe that it's not easy to put a pitch together in three days. Uh, so no. I really admire any one of the pitchers to being able to present and give us a great insights on their project. Thank you for sharing. And good luck with your work. And I'm sure this is only one of the many things that you're doing with your organization, colleagues and friends. So best of luck with, uh, with all these uh, endeavors. Very inspiring. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.